everyone. So I'm going to take a little time here to go over the story Feels Like White Elephants by Ernest Hemingway, which was the second short story that you were asked to read for homework last week. Let's go ahead and pull up our slide here. Okay. So, <laughs> the first thing I want to do is give you a brief summary of the story because this is not an easy one. Um, it, it's I almost feel bad having students read it because it can be so confusing. But at the same time, it's one of my favorites because it's so confusing. Um, because once you realize what is actually happening in the story, and you look at all of those literary elements that we've been discussing, when you look at the structure, when you look at the point of view, the setting and the atmosphere, the imagery and the symbolism, after you have figured out what's actually happening in the story, when you go back and consider those elements, it is astounding. It's masterful how Hemingway constructs this story that on the surface is very confusing, very frustrating, and seems like is about nothing. It seems like nothing happens in the story. Like we are, we have, no clue what's happening at the beginning and we probably still have no clue what's happening by the time we get to the end and we're not even sure we have understood anything that happened in the middle so if you read this story and were angry with me <laughs> i get it um but hopefully if you haven't already figured it out this will help uh not necessarily the summary but the whole powerpoint so those like white elephants so we have two people, the American and the girl. The girl is later referred to as Jig. I imagine that's a nickname, maybe not, maybe it's a real name. I don't know, the American never gets a name. Uh, it's just the American and the girl who he refers to once as Jig. They're sitting outside the bar of a train station somewhere in Spain. We know they're in Spain because the train station can take you one of two places, either to Barcelona or Madrid because it says the express from Barcelona will arrive in 40 minutes and continue to Madrid, All right? Uh, so the next train is gonna be coming soon. The station is situated between two different landscapes, right? So on one side of the station is a landscape that is very lush and full of life. There's trees and water and it's green. But on the other side of the station is a landscape that is very brown and dry and barren. And at times during the story, the girl also comments on the landscape and says that the hills on one side of the station look like white elephants. That's where the title comes from, hills like white elephants. We, we know to pay attention to titles, right? So hills like white elephants probably has some significance. So while the couple waits for the train, they have a few drinks and they carry on a conversation that it's clearly an attempt to ignore some sort of underlying tension. Like we feel the tension, we have no idea what the tension is about, but we know that what it, the, all of the things they're saying back and forth to each other, some of it is like seems innocent and innocuous. Other times it seems like they are definitely talking about something specific, even though we still don't know what that specific thing is. Um, the only thing that you know we kind of pick up on is that the American is trying to convince the girl to have some sort of operation, and she seems very undecided. The only thing she really comes close to revealing is that she wants their life, their relationship, to be as it has always been, traveling and drinking. But she isn't sure that's possible. Regardless of what decision she makes about this operation, she just for whatever reason, she just thinks that they can't ever go back to the way things were. He keeps reassuring her that they can, not a problem. <laughs> uh, and he also claims that he's fine with whatever decision she makes, though it's pretty clear he hopes that she will ultimately agree to the operation. By the time the story ends uh, and the couple's about to board the train, we really haven't learned much of anything except what I just mentioned in that little paragraph here. Uh, or at least it probably feels that way. But if we pinned paying attention, there's some stuff going on here, right? 
the entire story is dialogue practically, but it doesn't seem like they really talked about anything uh, specific. It was all very trite comments or veiled subtexts that force us to read between the lines. If we can, so even, even when we're forced to try, it's not easy. No, but if you do, you might come to realize that the American man was trying to convince Jig to have an abortion and that Jig seems to remain undecided as they head towards their next destination. We do not know ultimately what she decides to do. Whew. Ah, right? If you did not pick up on that, don't feel bad. <laughs> um, however, we're gonna go through these literary elements. And you're gonna see how it's actually all right there in front of us if we just thought to look at these things in, in such a way. But it's actually, you know, it's one of those things where it's, it's I don't wanna say it's obvious because it's not obvious, um, but at the same time, when you see how all these elements come together, it's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> but it's not easy. So let's look first at structure. So again, story is almost entirely dialogue. There are only seven short descriptive paragraphs. Um, those short descriptive paragraphs, though, have nothing to do with the dialogue. It's not like those those paragraphs that aren't dialogue. It's not like they explain the dialogue. They have nothing to do with the conversation that's taking place, at least on the surface. They don't. It doesn't. This, those paragraphs reveal nothing about the characters or whatever they're discussing this operation. Um, there's very little action, right? Jig goes from one side of the station to the other. They have some drinks. The man moves their bags. That's like literally all the action that there is. Um, so it's all talk, <laughs> no action. <laughs> and what little bit of descriptive, descriptive writing we get has nothing to do with these two characters or the conversation they're having. It's very confusing. Right. That narrative is tightly controlled because it's all dialogue. We hear the dialogue, but there is no narrator present to reveal the character's feelings and thoughts. All we have is the dialogue and these brief little moments of descriptive narration about the setting, about the landscape and the train station. This is what we call the iceberg theory. Anyway, is so famous for this. So the story itself, what we read is just the tip of the iceberg. The meaning of the story, what is actually happening in the story lies beneath. So all we get is that tip of the iceberg that's jutting out of the water. And somehow through the tip of the iceberg, we are supposed to figure out what's happening beneath the surface. Pretty frustrating but kind of worth it in the end, I think. So Hemingway's choice to construct this story completely out of dialogue forces us to listen. We have to listen to their conversation. Not easy, and we don't really get much from it. <laughs> it's like forcing us, it's only dialogue, but yet we don't get much out of dialogue. But that dialogue is what is the tip of the iceberg. That, that's the part that's jutting out of the water is the conversation. And maybe the reason that he does this is to show that we can't easily figure out what's really going on beneath the surface because the two characters are only speaking on the surface instead of discussing what lies beneath, right? So if the iceberg is just, you know, just the beginning. And what's really like the most important aspects are what lie beneath the surface. But the two characters in the story having the conversation never go below the surface. <laughs> um, how, what are we supposed to do? Right? We're relying on this conversation between these two characters to explain what's happening down here under the surface. Um, but we never get to what's beneath the surface because these two characters refuse to talk about it. 
I mean, they dance around it, <laughs> but they never actually talk about it. Look at point of view. It is an objective point of view, meaning we have a narrator, but we don't hear the narrator. Uh, doesn't, you know, all, it's like, uh, it's, it's like watching a film almost. Um, it doesn't tell us, the narrator does not tell us what the character thinker feel, only what they do, only what they see, and only what they say. The narrator uses very simple, compact sentences and paragraphs when it does break into those moments where we get the description of the surrounding area. Um, and because it's so short and so compact, it really forces us to focus on the dialogue. Only to realize the two characters never really say what's on their minds, what's on their hearts. Uh, and that kind of imitates life in a way. You know, we have to always interpret because we never truly know what someone else is thinking and feeling. Life is objective point of view. Or maybe first person, maybe we, you know, if we're telling our own story, um, we have our own thoughts and feelings, but um, in, you know, in life, that's the only point of view that we can ever be sure of. Um, and even then, perhaps we question it, but we're always having to interpret what others are thinking and feeling. So this little, um, glimpse, uh, almost like we're eavesdropping on this conversation, uh, kind of imitates life in that respect, where it's frustrating that we don't know what these characters are thinking and feeling, um, because that's what we're used to when we read stories. You know, we're used to at least getting one character's thoughts and feelings most of the time. Uh, we don't often read fiction in objective point of view. So, when we get into this story and these two characters are having this dialogue, and at first that's probably super exciting as a reader <laughs> to open up a story, and it's all dialogue because dialogue is usually very quick and it helps the story move along real fast, you know? And that's kind of where all of the best stuff happens is in the dialogue. But then you, you just keep going through the story, you keep waiting for, like, for it to get better, for it to make sense, and it doesn't. And it's because we don't have that typical narrator. We have objective point of view in this story. So we're just left with the words. We're not left, we don't get any clues. Well, we don't think we have any clues, but we do. Um, but it's just very interesting that it's uh, this objective point of view and nothing but dialogue. Crazy. All right. Let's take a look at the imagery, right? So we have imagery about the surroundings, the location they're at, at this train station. So it says, it starts, the hills across the valley of the Ebro were long and white. The Ebro is the river. So the hills across the valley of the Ebro, so there. Close against the side of the station, there was the warm shadow of the building and a curtain made of strings of bamboo beads hung across the open door into the bar to keep out flies. It was very hot. The, um, the hills were white in the sun and the country was brown and dry. She says they look like white elephants. So at one point she says, yes, everything tastes of licorice. Then we have a cross on the other side where fields of grain and trees along the banks of the Ebro, far away beyond the river were mountains. Um, the shadow of a cloud moved across the field of grain and she saw the river through the trees. This is like literally all the imagery we get. <laughs> uh, again, the story is almost all dialogue. Um, but it's interesting what the imagery that we do get, especially here, um, you know, the hills across the valley, the Ebro were long and white. This part, uh, the hills were white in the sun and the country was brown and dry. They look like white elephants. And then this section about the other side, that actually becomes super important, which we will get to when we care. Motifs, remember this is when sort of a, a imagery is repeated. 
there is definitely the motif of drinking. Um, we get images and references to drinking a lot. Uh, you know, they immediately start drinking large beers. Uh, as soon as she mentions white elephant, she asks to order more drinks. It's almost like whatever white elephant makes her think of, she immediately wants to, to keep drinking more. Um, she says, I wanted to try this new drink. That's all we do, isn't it? Look at things and try new drinks. Seems to be their lifestyle. Um, and by the end, the American is drinking at the bar and Jig is drinking alone at the table. And, you know, not only is, does this seem to be sort of par for the course for them, um, sitting around, traveling, trying new drinks. There's also something to be said for this right here, right? As soon as Jig mentions the white elephant, she asks to order more drinks. Almost as if the drinking is to help ease the tension or to have something else to focus on instead of whatever's on her mind, perhaps. And then of course, let's move to symbolism. If you had not thought about it yet, um, again, it's a good idea to always consider the title of a piece. So the fact that this story was called Hills Like White Elephants. And at one point in the story, Jig says that the hills look like white elephants. We should probably pay attention to that concept. And the white elephant actually is a symbol. There's first a white elephant gift, right? It is a gift that someone doesn't want, that, you know, if you've ever been to a white elephant gift exchange, you bring something typically that you already own from your, from your own house that you don't want. Uh, I don't, I'm, I'm sure certain groups have certain rules. Maybe it has to be something that was never opened, <laughs> that you never used. Maybe it can be used already. I don't know. Um, but it's something you already own typically that you don't want. And then you exchange gifts in this that can be complicated or simple depending on the group of people doing the exchange. But it is essentially something that um, probably no one really wants. Jig says the hills look like white elephants. So is there a gift? that she and the American, I gotta close this, out of there. Is there a gift that she and the American might not want? She later takes it back and says, you don't really look like white elephants. So maybe Jig actually does want the gift. Maybe it's not so much a white elephant gift, but just a gift. There's also, you know, when we, use the term, you know, elephant, you can't help but think of the phrase, you know, the elephant in the room, which is something painfully obvious that no one wants to discuss. White elephants are albino elephants and they are very rare. We also have to think about the color white representing or symbolizing innocence and purity. So these white elephants, all of this together, all of these um, possible explanations, they actually all work together. <laughs> so it is something painfully obvious that no one wants to discuss. Um, a, a gift, possibly wanted, possibly unwanted, that is rare and represents innocence and purity. It's a baby. Now, the atmosphere, very tense. We know this, right? Set in an unfamiliar place, right? We've never, well, we don't live in Spain. Hemingway visited Spain a lot, but he's an American. Um, it's very hot outside. When it's hot, things always become more uncomfortable, more tense. They immediately start drinking, a sure sign of tension and discomfort. Often alcohol is used as a buffer for difficult conversations, right? Um, there is short, terse dialogue. The longest sentence on the first page is only five words. And it is the American snapping at Jig. 
more than five words. Um, just because you say I wouldn't doesn't do anything. Everything is, oh, it's, she even begs him to stop talking at one point, right? The, at, the whole atmosphere is very uncomfortable and tense. And even when we're reading it, and we know it's just a short story with characters that are totally fictional, like it makes us tense and uncomfortable. Um, and we come to realize if we're paying attention that their relationship is tense and uncomfortable. <laughs> not, like everything about this story is tense. And every element of the story feeds into that tension and, and mirrors it and emphasizes it. And it's, uh, man, I, I, gosh, other than maybe like a gothic story or um, like a horror story, I don't, in my reading experience, I have not often come across a piece that from start to finish is so successful at creating an atmosphere that also mirrors what's happening between characters. So it's worth noting how tense the atmosphere is. What about the setting? Well, we'll just say, you know, Hemingway, early 1900s was when he wrote, right? Okay, that's worth noting. But I want to focus on the actual setting of the story, the location. So we know that on this side of the train station, we have hills that are long and white. There's no shade, no trees. The land is very brown and dry. The setting on this side is lifeless and barren, just as Jig would be if she has the abortion. On the other side, we have fields of grain, trees, rivers, and mountains. The other side is full of life just as Jig is now pregnant, just as that unborn child is, right? Full of life, if she were to give birth to it, it would have a full life. So the setting on the outside of the train station becomes symbolic of her predicament, her choices. She has to choose between life and no life. Both for the pregnancy and herself, because as we could sort of pick up on in the story, you know, having this baby means her life with the American will change dramatically. This whole lifestyle that they have of traveling and drinking and hanging out and talking, it's not gonna, they're not gonna be able to do that anymore. But yet, she is afraid that even if she chooses to terminate the pregnancy, they'll never get that back. He is like, sure we will. Yeah, just have the operation. Everything's gonna be fine. We'll go back to normal. Like nothing ever happened. And that's what kind of clues us into the fact that she is indecisive, is because she says it's not ours. We can't get it back. Because if she chooses to have the baby, life as she knows it with the American will change. It'll never go back to the way it was. If she chooses to terminate they have the freedom to go back to the way that it was, but she will be different. And she's not sure that she can go back to that. No matter what, it seems like they're doomed. Um, it does not seem like this relationship is going to stand the test of time. Uh, but ultimately, we know that this is her situation. She is stuck between these two possible choices. And then we have the train station and there's only two tracks, right? From Madrid to Barcelona, Barcelona to Madrid. There's only two choices, life, no life. The 
train is coming soon, so a decision has to be made soon. We don't ever really know what she decided. We can take some educated guesses and theorize, but when the story ends, we don't know. We don't know what she's going to ultimately choose to do. So, how does all of that work to reveal our themes? Again, we have to think about what we've learned about the characters, what we've learned about the structure, the imagery and the symbolism, the point of view, the setting and the atmosphere, how it all works together. Theme one, communication. All right, this goes back to um, how the setting and the dialogue immediately create a tense atmosphere. We know the American and Jig are clearly debating an issue. Even their lighthearted comments lead to tense responses and emotional reactions. It probably would have been taboo for Hemingway to write about abortion in an open and frank way during that time period. But the point is actually about communication. Everybody thinks it's about abortion. But it's, it's not, because we don't know what she chooses. So it's not really about uh, his thoughts on it or his opinions on it. Um, it's really about communication. Because in addition to never actually saying the word abortion, neither character ever truly admits their thoughts or their feelings or their desires. They hint at it, you know. He says he loves her, he doesn't want anyone but her. She asks if things will go back to the way they were, you know, but they don't, they don't really talk about how they feel at all. The tension and confusion we feel while we're reading it would go away immediately if only they would just talk about what's really going on. Likewise, their own tension, their own discomfort, would probably be alleviated in some way if they would just talk about what's going on, get to the heart of the matter and, and talk about it openly and honestly and not in these little veiled attempts to broach the subject but not really broach the subject. And then she even begs him to stop talking. They keep ignoring the elephant in the room and that is never the right way to go about things. It's never the right answer never gets you to a good place um and the fact that we never really learn what she chooses um and we only hear this one discussion it's it's that just further emphasizes that what we're really supposed to focus on is how they discuss it not the ultimate decision that the kids made that's 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 really beside the point as far as anyway's concerned what he is trying to get us to focus on is how these two people discussed this super important topic. And that is to say that they don't really discuss this super important topic. And it affects both of them greatly. And yet they refuse to truly communicate about it. Another theme we have here is obviously choices, right? So we have a choice between baby versus no baby and emotion versus reason. And obviously it's significant that the setting is basically at a two-way train station in the middle of nowhere. You know, the setting on the on either side of the station is revealing. We talk about that life versus no life. Um, it's clear a choice must be made, right? Which direction to take the train, keep the baby or terminate choose to live by reason or emotion. We've already really, we've looked at the significance of the two-way train station here. We have looked at that choice between, you know, keeping the baby or terminating the pregnancy. Let's look at the third one then, because we haven't really talked about that yet, um, living by reason versus emotion, right? All right, so the American super reasonable dude, Right. Um, we kind of get the sense that he is a little older, especially since they're 
referred to as the American in the girl. Um, and he sort of treats her in that respect sometimes in the story. Uh, you can tell that he kind of assumes that he is more mature and sophisticated than she is. He ridicules her, her, her white elephant remark. Um, he, every time he refers to the operation, he is very reasonable. He is very logical about it. Um, he reasons that their life, i.e. his life, shouldn't be interrupted. They should be able to do as they please. Um, he even remarks at the end that all the other people when he goes to move the bags, and then he stops back inside the bar before he joins her again. He's watching all the other people. He says all the other people are waiting reasonably for the train, as if to say she, Jig, is not being reasonable. So Jig is much more emotional and imaginative. So she makes this unexpected remark about the hills, somewhat creative, right? She questions his feelings and his motives. Um, and she realizes that despite what he says, despite how many times he promises, things will never be the way they used to be. He keeps saying, yes, just, you know, take care of this. I, I just have the abortion. I mean, we can go back and continue on with our lives just like we were, right? Just a little bump in the road, nothing to worry about. Just get it done, take care of it so we can, you know, keep doing our thing. Seems reasonable, right? <laughs> she is experiencing this on a much more emotional level. She's the one who understands that no, it, as much as I would love for that to be true, as much as I would love to believe you that we can go back and things be just like they were, that is not going to happen because either I'm going to keep this baby and our lives change drastically, or at least my life changes drastically, or I, I abort this baby and how can I go ever go back to the way things were? How could things ever be the same, right? Seems like she's a little smarter at times, right? She allows, um, she has a much more emotional reaction to the conversation. She allows the weight of this issue to affect her, rightfully so. Um, she allows the tension of the conversation to affect her when she begs him to stop talking. It's as if she's tired of hearing what he has to say. Um, and she's the one who ends the conversation, right? And finally, at the end, she says, there's nothing wrong with me. I feel fine. So he is a very static and unchanging character. And we could go so far as to say he is a bit of a selfish character. Um, he does not really seem to be taking her feelings into account. Um, he just wants this problem resolved so that he can go on living his life uninterrupted. If she happens to still be along for the ride, so be it. She actually, although we don't, it's really easy to miss, Jake actually kind of grows and, and matures a little bit through the course of the, of the conversation. You know, she seems to finally sort of get it. Um, that no matter what he says, things will never be the same for her, one way or the other. Uh, so despite the fact that the American man seems to be more reasonable, it is our emotional, imaginative character that um, changes and grows. So I think that there is something to be said for what Hemingway was trying to get us to um, think about these two characters. I think it's really easy to read the story and I think it's easy to read the story and think that they're both annoying. Um, but I think it's really easy to find her annoying, especially when you don't, if you don't realize what they're talking about. If 
you don't realize what he's trying to convince her to do, to pressure her to do, it's really easy to read this conversation and think to yourself, God, why is she being like that? <laughs> like, just, oh my goodness. You know, it's really easy to see him as the mature, reasonable individual that we are supposed to sympathize with. Like, oh my gosh, just, you know, why, why you, that's what you get for being with a young girl, being with someone your own age. But no, that's actually not really what anybody wants us to walk away with. Once we figure out what they're talking about, what the operation is, and then we reread the dialogue, and really think about what he is saying to her and how he is saying it to her. Then you spend and we think about all the different things that she says. Then it's like, oh, oh no, you're, you're kind of a jerk. <laughs> hmm. Okay, uh, didn't see that coming. She's the one, you know? And I think it's because she allows herself to, um, to feel uh, she is, obviously thinking about herself, of course, um, but she's not only thinking about herself. He is. Um, so I don't think that we're supposed to necessarily think, oh, you know, living by reason is bad. Living by emotion is good. No, I think it's that he makes the American seem reasonable so that we can naturally side with him at first. Because then when we realize what is actually happening, we then we actually feel more empathy for Jig once we realize that we were kind of duped too, right? So it's not that reason is bad, emotion is good. That's not really the point. It's, it's um, he makes them this way to sort of trick us in a way. I mean, the whole thing is trickery. But <laughs> the whole story is trickery. But um, I do think that that is, you know, we do sometimes assume that to be reasonable is better than to be emotional. And in this instance, he is kind of showing us, don't assume that that's always true, right? Because sometimes you have to feel. Because if you don't feel, you come off like this guy. <laughs> right? I don't know. So. Um, that's what we have here. It feels like white elephants. I know, again, it's creepy, confusing, frustrating story. Um, but that's why it ends up being one of my all time favorite stories to read and teach and think about is because it is everything is so underneath the surface. And what we get with the tip of that iceberg is very little. And then once you look at little details, then it becomes clear how much actually is revealed in the tip of that iceberg. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Um, this story will show up on the short stories exam in week 10. And you'll need to be able to discuss those themes and how those literary elements work within the story to help reveal and reinforce that theme. So, uh, I know it was a confusing story to begin with. I hope that you know my explanation and the PowerPoint um, clears up that confusion. But if it didn't, or if there's anything else, anything about the story that you still have questions about, please reach out because I'm going to make sure that you know uh, that I explain it to you in a way that works for you so that you can do well on that question on the short stories exam, right? So don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, you guys are free to go ahead and move on. <laughs>